right, Bill, take it away. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate the the kind uh, introduction and also the kind invite to to spend some time with all of you. Um, it actually really is the the most fun part of my job. I would much rather go on YouTube and answer questions from 16 year olds about crypto than pretty much work on anything else that I, I have in my day anyway. So um, doing it with people that actually know crypto is even is even better. So I'm really excited about this. I don't get to do it with the kind of OGs and people who know what's what anymore. I'm, I'm usually dealing with with newbies. So I'm excited to answer some questions uh, that are a little harder. So so hope you're, you guys are winding up the rubber band. Um, let's see. So get out of the way. There's a little bit of a shadow in the background here. Okay. So what what I thought I would do is and I've got a demo here. Hopefully you guys have all got Abra uh, running. Um, I won't I won't just do a demo. I'll, I'll use the demo to answer questions later. So I'll just speak for now. But I thought what I'd do is is uh, give you our perspective on what it means to build uh, the next generation crypto bank. I don't know if it's going to be called crypto bank by the time 100 million people are using it, uh, but that's what we're calling it for now, and it's it's something that we can all get our arms around. And when I say crypto bank, I'm talking about basically really three things. One, consumer-facing features that are analogous to what we think about in banking. Right, whether it's the ability to send money, the ability to get a loan, the ability to make investments, earn interest, um, you know, trade, do foreign exchange, what I might think about with a regular bank, but but actually using crypto rails to make that work. Two, the platforms in the crypto space that are required uh, to make all of this work, and uh, unfortunately, per, per part one of this conversation. You know all of the necessary regulatory and and compliance oversight uh, f fulfillment that needs to to go into making all of that work, and I would overlay on that all of the country specific functions around liquidity management, which I'll I'll talk about. We were having a sidebar before we started tonight about what it means to run a, a service like this in, in in markets like the Philippines and Mexico and India, that are actually cash economies, and a significant percentage of our active user base uses Abra in and out via cash, not via bank account. And we'll talk about how uh, how that works and why it's important. So so I'll, I'll make like a few minutes of comments and then I'd love to open it up for questions and talk about any anything uh, on this topic that you all would like. And I know that there's some questions teed up already, that's great. Um, and uh, we have some folks, uh, we're streaming this out on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Periscope and, and Facebook. We always get people, it depends on the time of day and now it's Asia. so. We'll probably get more folks from Asia than we would normally get since it's their morning there. So welcome to all of them. Um, so so I'll talk about the user perspective first, right? So think about this. Um, you've got, um, think about the average retail bank, right? Uh, we may loathe Bank of America, Wells Fargo here in the U.S. and their brethren in other countries, but their services stack is, is, is wide and deep, right? It's uh, the ability to make deposits, the ability to make payments, the ability to pay bills, the ability to get a mortgage, the ability to get a car loan, uh, the ability in some cases to invest in stocks and, 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 and other services that may, you know, and then there's small business and there's larger business. And, and so the breadth of services is significant, right? Uh, behavior, totally different issue. We can talk about that all day, but breadth of services is significant. So if we want to talk about the core components of building a, a new banking experience, we really have to address how do we store money in this, in this new world? And also what, what, what does money become? So we spend a lot of time just thinking about the basics of, of how are we gonna store money in the future, right? And is it different for you know, uh, an upper middle class worker in the United States versus a poor farmer in, in Mindanao or rural Mexico, for example, or Guatemala, okay? Um, and then crypto. Crypto is another asset class um, that we, you know, didn't have to think about before. Banks certainly don't care about it, but but our users do. And in the new kind of the new era of, of crypto banking, obviously it's going to be front and center. And then there's also the kind of the, there's the part that everybody thinks about today in terms of making money, which is trading and exchanging. But we think about that in terms of just speculation right now. Well, if your travel acts at the airport. Right? You don't think about it in terms of speculation. You think about it in terms of consumer experience. I'm getting off my plane. I need to, I've got a bunch of extra euros. I want to get rid of my euros and give me my dollars so I can go about my day. And there's no reason why that shouldn't be the same perspective in the crypto world. I've got a bunch of you know, stable coin euros that I don't need anymore. And I want to push a button and I want to get um, you know, 
I want to get my, my stablecoin dollars or back to my Bitcoin or whatever I'm using in between. Um, so then, the, so there's that tra that trading and exchanging piece of it. You know, th then then of course we have to talk about investing. Right now, we're kind of in the first inning of that, right? So I think we're seeing the first signs of the crypto bank moving beyond just speculation into investing, right? So services like Abra, BlockFi, Celsius, others have have interest bearing products. Of course, everybody wants to talk about DeFi, so I'm sure I'll get questions about that. Happy to talk about it, but then there's you know chasing yield in the DeFi world, which isn't going to stop. It's actually going to accelerate um, and helps us as well. Um, but then there's other types of investing, um, stocks, bonds. You know we've we've tested some of that, some some w with great success from a consumer perspective and mixed success from a regulatory perspective. Um, but it has to be addressed because the demand is real, the demand is there, and so you can't just basically say, okay, I'm going to move to crypto banking and ignore all of these services that people want. And by the way, you know, going back to the global perspective, people want these services, whether they're in rural villages or whether they're in New York City, and whether they're putting $5 to work or $500,000 to work, that money matters to them equally on a, on a relative basis, right? The fact that I'm making 20% of my $5 or 20% of my $500,000 means the same thing to each of those people. Right. And then and then there's payments. Right. How do I do person to person payments? Right. And, and 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 make that scale. Right. We in 2020. Right. It is so expensive to move money around. And I've been talking about this. Uh, you know, we, we got an update on the regulatory stuff out of the gate. I, I was doing working with the DBOs and remittances nationally before crypto existed. And nothing's really changed. It's just as expensive now to send money as it was when I was doing that work pre Bitcoin. And so when is the promise of the crypto bank going to address payments domestic and cross-border and everybody thinks about cross-border but domestic is hard too it's it's in some ways more expensive to send money uh domestically especially real time in the united states than it is cross-border um it just depends depends what you're doing and then you have to think about other things that are country specific like tax preparation right if you're investing and speculating and using crypto for these things how do you help people pay their taxes so these are all things that we have to think about from a consumer facing perspective to even start to think about building that global crypto bank. And that's what we've been doing from a consumer perspective uh, for, for five years now. Okay. So on the platform side, the first thing we think about is, okay, what does it mean to be a bank, right? There's the, the crypto kind of mantra of be your own bank, which quite honestly, the average consumer can't handle right now. Um, a lot of you can handle that. I can handle that for the most part, but the average consumer can't. So, you know, crypto bank probably means how am I going to manage their digital assets for them today? That may change over time. Um, and what are the implications of that from a regulatory perspective, but from a technology perspective and a user experience perspective, but, but really I primarily concern myself right now with scalability and, and, and underlying all of what I'm going to say about platform. My, my biggest concern right now is scalability. So stable coins, right, primarily run on Ethereum, Tron, and Omni today, you know, not going to scale today. I hope that changes. Um, and we'll talk about that some more in a minute. But uh, smart contracts, uh, things like, you know, running synthetic assets, things like um, chasing yield and, and being able to uh, build uh, multi-signature based uh, lending contracts and agreements, uh, time lock transactions for things like P2P payments in, in a Lightning Network. We've just started to scratch the surface of what um, you know the, the 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 global virtual machine can do, but we've also started to scratch the surface of the scalability problems of that global virtual machine. And I apologize in advance that I'm going to be making that scalability statement over and over again tonight. But we all have a vested role in um, things like Ethereum 2.0 to, to address that problem. Um, now, in the CFI world, we have to think about investment teams, right? How do we generate yield for consumers? So at Abra, I have a CIO, a chief investment officer, whose sole responsibility is to generate yield for consumers and generate a small profit as part of that yield, literally a small profit. It's the opposite of what banks do, right? Uh, banks focus on their profit first and your yield second. We focus on your yield first and our profit second. Uh, but his primary role is to generate that yield with his team. And we do that, and it's hard. And it's hard because we're not willing to see the yield go up and down like this via people chasing yield farms all day. Um, it has to be steady, 
right? So now on stable coins, we can do 10% because we've busted our asses to basically put a buffer and, and make sure that accounting for withdrawals and, and new deposits that we can give people a daily, uh, you know, one divided by 365 times 10% a year compounded uh, daily as an interest rate. And, and that's hard to do, very hard to do. And so, so you have to, so then there's the, the next, the next thing I think about is, is starting to get into how do we deal with the real world, right? So the first thing about the real world is liquidity management. When I talk about liquidity, I talk about, um, you know, how do I get money in and out of the system, right? So if I've got pesos in my hands in Manila, dollars in my hands in Sacramento, how do I get those dollars into an app like Abra so that I can, earn interest, buy my stocks, um, you know, make my mutual fund investments, buy my crypto, whatever it is I want to do. Or, and the other way around, how do I get the money out, not just uh, in cash, but to my bank account? And for us, we think about it from $5 to $5 million, right? I literally had meetings today dealing with both extremes, right? I have cash users who want to deposit $10, and I have rich bankers who want to deposit a $1 million. And we we do whatever we have to do to make it work for all of them, uh, because this is the only way that the crypto bank is going to work. And it's ethically and morally what's right. right? And, and, and in crypto, that's really hard. And again, and there's a scalability issue. There's a user experience issue. There's a boots on the ground issue. Um, and so then in terms of platform, right, we talked about smart contracts. You have to think about what's centralized and what's decentralized, because that also that also affects regulation, right, which is a big challenge here, right? So now in, in smart contracts, the, the, the Oracle problem has become acute and I, this problem is going to get worse, right? There's no such thing as DeFi today. And when I say there's no such thing as DeFi, I'm not trying to be provocative. It's a fact, right? So if you have an off switch, you're not decentralized, right? So, so what's decentralized today? BitTorrent is decentralized. Bitcoin is decentralized. Uh, Bitcoin, uh, I'm sorry, Ethereum is probably decentralized. Ethereum Classic is obviously not decentralized uh, because if you can do a civil attack, you can you, you can probably shut it off anyway. Uh, and, and so so we have to think about these things um, in terms of you know what's decentralized, what's not decentralized. And the Oracle problem actually makes it even worse because you take a decentralized system like Ethereum and you actually add a centralized component on top because Ethereum's the matrix. And the Oracle represents the real world, and we need a hard line into the matrix, right? And today, the only way to make a hard line into the matrix of Ethereum is the Oracle. And we don't know how to create a truly decentralized Oracle. Companies like like Link, uh, um, you know, Chainlink are trying. And and when I, by the way, when I can say companies like, even if it's a nonprofit, that's concerning, right? Because companies can be shut down, right? I understand the um, the academic aspects of what it means to create a decentralized oracle, but we're not there yet. We haven't proven that we can do that. Uh, even Dai, for example, has to get the price of the underlying assets from the real world. Again, Dai is like being inside the matrix, but Dai won't work if we don't know what the price of any of the underlying assets is versus the dollar in order to basically change the mix of all the assets that make up the synthetic. So these are all things that we have to think about. A few weeks ago, when we reached like peak hysteria on DeFi, we were seeing $20 gas fees on transactions. Again, that's insanity. That goes back to 2017 when we were at peak insanity with CryptoKitties. And so we had to go to our users, many of whom are actually really dependent upon this stuff now, and say, hey, you can't do um, a transaction under $25 for at least a few days because we have to charge you $20 gas fees. It makes no sense. Right. And so those users are outraged. Right. I, I you know, I, I don't know what to tell them, except I'm outraged, too. But we can all be outraged at each other. It's not like there's some, uh, you know, company making decisions and pulling strings behind the scenes saying, let's make, you know, gas fees twenty dollars. It's a function of what's happening on Uniswap and other DEXs at the time that are basically driving up gas fees because the transactions are 100 percent on chain. Now, obviously, this will get better over time. Uh, but we have a, a multi-dimensional uh, problem here, which is when is it going to get better versus when do people want to start really using these services at scale? And I would posit that people want to start using these services at scale now. <laughs> and, and the technology is not ready now to scale uh, to do this. And, and so we're probably going to be relegated to very high dollar volume transactions at scale. 
Um, I'm pretty confident that we're going to see a run up to 20, 20, 25K in Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, whatever the, the corresponding price would be over the coming months. And, you know, we're going to get back to $30, $40 uh, mining fee, network fees in, on, on, um, on Bitcoin and, and similar, you know, similar problems on, on Ethereum. And it's going to take a year for phase zero to, to basically get out there and, and have enough uh, people being staked to get to phase one in Ethereum. So it's, it's, it's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, and so, um, and then the last part of course is, is compliance and licensing, right? So if you're operating in, in, in the CFI world today, centralized finance, and you're doing anything around lending in, in terms of, of storing people's crypto, you've got money transfer licenses that we talked about earlier. We've got lending licenses, um, you know, and that's just the U S and then you have to look at other countries, you know, Mexico has got their stored value licensing regime. And then, you know, a- anyway, you know, the e-money license uh, regimes in Europe are a whole other layer. And so, so as, as a crypto bank, like that second, um, aspect of this is, is clearly, uh, platform and compliance and licensing is not going to go away. Um, I applaud California, by the way, back to the, the, la- the, the intro comments that California actually waited um, and, and looked at what everybody else was doing and said, what makes sense vis-a-vis existing laws? You know, the government has said, I don't agree that Bitcoin's a commodity, by the way, but whatever, it doesn't matter. The government said Bitcoin's a commodity. Uh, it's software, by the way. It's not a commodity, but it doesn't matter. Um, they've said it's a commodity. The ship has sailed. So we'll wait and figure out what the right regulation should be vis-a-vis existing laws. And they did. They, they took a, a reasonable wait-and-see approach as opposed to New York, which basically took a heavy-handed approach and and, and they have a bunch of pissed off consumers now who can't get my service or a whole bunch of other services, except for the people that are willing to pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in, in fees, which is basically what's involved in, in, in running that kind of regime. You know, then what I think about um, is who might get there before us and why, right? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, because I, I started Abra from a mission-driven perspective. I was working in Haiti and Mexico, working on remittances and money transfer. I don't need to do this. So if I'm going to be mission driven, uh, is there somebody that can do it better than us? Right. And so, so I really think about it today in three buckets, right? I think about, uh, the exchanges, right. And the exchanges are very speculator casino driven, uh, you know, from the extreme, you know, the folks that Arthur calls the degenerate gamblers. And I'm sure there's a few of those among us to, you know, the more kind of Gemini types where, the whole, the whole marketing message is about, you know, licensing and regulation and all that stuff. I'm not sure it's a good marketing message, but it, it apparently regulates, it it resonates with someone. Sorry. Um, and, and so I don't know if they make the transition from specul enabling speculation, the casino mentality to the bank mentality. Um, the second bucket that I think about is obviously Abra, and our direct competitors, the the pure play, what I call crypto banks, wallet apps that are adding more features, um, you know, people that are labeling crypto lending, uh, interest earning products like we do in crypto, um, the ability to do payments, card based and network access via crypto, things like that, that I think we're all going to want to use in, in the coming months and years. And the last is is the fang companies that we call them in stock world, uh, particularly Facebook at the top of the list, right, Libra and whatever they're going to do. And the only thing that really makes Libra interesting today is is the existing user base, right? It's WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger and, and to a certain degree, uh, Instagram, but but they don't really like Facebook. So I think they're going to do their own thing. But but certainly, even if it ends up being PayPal 2.0 and not really decentralized crypto, which is where I think they're headed, um, it's important because a billion people are going to touch it very quickly. And that's part of the reason why it's becoming pay, pay, PayPal 2.0. If they wanted a decentralized solution, there isn't one that would work for Facebook numbers today. So they really backed into doing what they're doing uh, out of necessity. They really have no choice. Um, so, so those are the things that we think about at Abra when, when we think about uh, uh, you know, crypto banking and, and the future of kind of decentralized systems as they relate to consumer. Uh, and then we have a whole business side to the business in terms of generating the yield, um, you know, doing uh, institutional lending, uh, which really helps support in a large part the consumer business and that's growing gangbusters as well and and that's fantastic it's 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 actually rebuilding an analogous part of the stack as it relates to traditional banking because now we've got you know business we don't really do fractional reserve banking in the traditional sense uh crypto is a little bit different thank god uh but but there is an analogous stack and so 
Um, I could go on for another hour about what we're doing, um, but why don't I stop there and see if there's some initial questions um, that that you all are, are uh, dying to ask, and, and I'm happy to go back and talk in more detail about any of this stuff as well, but um, maybe that's uh, a good place to see what uh, what's on people's minds. There are a couple questions that actually um, connect pretty closely with some of your last statements there. Uh, actually, someone in the meetup chat asked, Specifically, what your opinion is of fractional reserve? Uh, is, it, is it a critical element of market banking? Um, does it need to be? Will it undermine like the model? Will it undermine the future of banking? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, it's it's. Um, what do I think of fractional reserve banking? It's not necessary. Okay. Um, we have we 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 operate in an inflationary system today, not in a deflationary system. Um, Productivity wants and, and, and technological development actually wants prices to go down, not up. We've artificially created a system that uh, pushes prices up over time when the technology is basically fighting that tooth and nail. Sometimes the tech wins regardless of what the government thinks. Um, and so, you know, if we had a purely Bitcoin based economy, for example, with a with the true def provably deflationary asset over time, because we're still inflating Bitcoin, um, what would happen? Well, the world wouldn't stop spinning on its axis and, and, and people would still, uh, capitalism would still function. Um, and I actually predict prices of, of, of staples would, would, would come down and technology would be a big driver of that because the government wouldn't be there to interfere uh, and slow down progress in the background. Now, we have to get back to reality because that's not going to change in the next 10 years. Um, and, and, and obviously, we're, we're inflating uh, the existing currency base at an alarming rate. I don't know what that's going to imply when the roosters, uh, anyway, when the musical chairs stop. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, um, but it scares me. Um, at the same time, we're in kind of the last phases of a, of a multi-decade debt cycle, which has predictably led to a lot of this populism that we see now, which is contrary to what a lot of people think, predictable uh, as part of these debt cycles. And so how it all plays out after that, I don't know. But I know that you can actually look at when we came off the gold standard. And you guys all know this. You're in gals. You're all in crypto. You've, you, I'm not telling you you haven't seen online a hundred times. But if you look at where we came off the gold standard, it's almost like, you know, a clean break in, in our society. And it's crystal clear almost to the day when it happened just by looking at certain key indicators. And um, that tells us we, didn't, we don't need to basically enable the types of leverage that we do in banking, back to the question, in order for society to function. We don't. But we've chosen to do it that way at the expense of a lot of people's wealth. Now, what that also tends to do is it te fractional reserve banking tends to make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And again, it doesn't need to be that way. That's an arbitrary decision that is largely a function of the fact that, that this death by a thousand cuts happens relatively slowly. Your money is whittled in value to zero over 100 years. Now, what's going to happen when lifespans start going up, right? And people, it becomes more acute that the government is, is, is eroding the value of our money because we're alive, we're alive longer to see it. That's interesting to me. That's when I think it's, it's really going to start to hit home to people besides the people in Argentina and, and Brazil and Venezuela, you know, who've, who've lived through this before in, in, a, in a way that it's, it's very short term. Um, we'll see. Uh, but uh, it doesn't need to be that way. Somebody asked something related to the yield uh, that you have on Agra. Sure. Now, relatively speaking, yields are pretty high uh, compared to conventional banking. Does the future of banking, do you, do you see the future of banking um, evolving in, in some way where maybe the philosophy that Abra has is adopted? Uh, is it a future of banking where yields and conventional banking is now the same as what we see in, in DeFi or crypto banking? Yeah, I mean, I, I, a couple of thoughts on this, right? So we're, we're, we're at the beginning of a multi-decade game, all right? And so because uh, crypto is relatively illiquid compared to traditional assets still because uh, crypto is is usually Tesla shares and, and gold recently aside, usually more volatile than traditional assets. It, it has underlying um, uh, yield opportunities, right, that we're able to exploit. Now, 
20 years from now, if you've got a deflationary asset that's that's no longer generating significantly new um, inflation, um, in theory, it shouldn't be possible to generate 5% yield forever. <laughs> this is something about the laws of math that, that I think break down over time. So we're in this kind of um, conversion period, in my opinion, that's just started from thinking about the old world to all of us who are in the know where the vast majority of people have no idea what we're talking about with this transition to a new way of thinking about banking. And even stable coins right now are only used for enabling speculation. Very few people use stable coins for sending money or anything beyond trading on Binance or, or, or Abra, wherever else they do their transactions. But Circle and, and, and Trust Token and a bunch of other companies have bet their future on the fact that that's not going to be the case 10 years from now, that people are going to be using stable coins for trade finance, right, in, in um, money transfer and remittances and a whole bunch of other applications that completely upend traditional banking. And I actually believe that's going to happen. And we've made the same bet. We're not the underlying platform provider. Uh, we're the user, but but we're making a bet that that's, that's true as well. So there's a lot of opportunities during that transition, is my point, to generate that yield. And we're committed to helping people do that. I don't know what it's going to look like in 10 years, but it's really help helping us kickstart that transition because it's exciting, right? I can look, I can actually tell you with with complete honesty that I'm putting a significant port of, part of my net worth into Abra high yield uh, interest bearing accounts because I'm confident that it's 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 not a speculative bet like you know just blindly lending money to somebody on the street uh, because I know how our system works and how we we basically choose those investments and that's great because it's helping facilitate that transition that I'm talking about. Bill, 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 could you be less shy and tell us what the yield is on some of the uh, stable coins and uh, Bitcoin? I'm sorry, uh, do, do your voice a little bit um, low. Can you s s say, try again? Oh, I, I was wondering if you could be a little bit less shy and tell us what the yields are on Abra nowadays. Oh, sure. Um, uh, so we we generate uh, for consumers 10% on dollars and stablecoin deposits, and we generate about four and a quarter, maybe four and a half. I don't remember the exact number. I think it's four and a quarter percent on Bitcoin and Ethereum. And uh, I'll tell you off the record, we'll be launching more cryptos for, for yield generation um, in the coming days and weeks. Um, and, you know, to do that every day and not have the rates go up and down, as I said, is very hard. And uh, kudos to the Abra team um, that works on that to do that. Someone asked a question about um, coins and what attributes you think are important and why. They say between uh, attributes such as interoperability, privacy features such as um, zero knowledge cryptography, uh, governance, or DeFi elements, what makes a project really special and um, what, what, what do you like about these coins? Yeah, th this is a tough one for me personally, because I believe that, you know, I have a lot of friends who are pure Bitcoin maximalists and don't understand why I do what I do with Abra. Bill, you don't need to do this. Why are you doing it? And I strongly believe that the best chance for Bitcoin to thrive long term is the competition from a technology perspective that's happening with projects that a lot of core developers have never heard of. And I asked them, like, what do you think of this project? And they don't know. They never heard of it because they're in their bubble. And that's fine. We need them, we need them in their bubble to a certain degree. But if we don't think about long-term uh, fungibility of, of, of UTXOs, for example, uh, Bitcoin's got a big problem, a big problem. And there are other, my point is there's other projects that are thinking about Right, uh, you know, fungibility via some of the technologies you mentioned, like whether it's in Zcash or Monero or whatever, and those technologies will eventually make their way into Bitcoin, and some of them may survive in some of these tokens in their own right, and some of those tokens may die. The difference today, and this is why I struggle with this, is 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 that historically and throughout my career, we've had technology competition like we do now. But it's, it hasn't been the retail investor that's been funding that competition, right? It often started in university labs, angel funding, commercialization, 
now everybody can fork a, a protocol on the weekend, put it out uh, via some new DeFi food name on meme on Sunday, and has got a million dollars in there on Monday. Now, I'm not saying that's a good or bad. It just is. And it certainly helps us from a protocol perspective see the strengths and weaknesses of, of the, the underlying protocols like, you know, Ethereum. And uh, last night I was looking at, at somebody's analysis of, of some smart contracts that they were releasing or that were released a couple of hours earlier uh, via some other meme, not sushi, but, but you know, a derivative of that. And, and people were already putting hundreds of thousands into it within minutes. And, and to my knowledge, the person whose, whose comments I was reading was literally the first person besides a developer who had even read the damn contract. And, and so that scares me a little bit because it reflects on, on all of us, you know, Abra as an enabler of some of that. We don't, we don't necessarily list every one of these projects in real time. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't, we can't keep up. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the public is basically testing these projects for developers with their money. And um, I, I, again, I don't opine whether that's good or bad. It just is. And it's accelerating. It's, it's, it's not going away. And um, I think to a certain degree, we all need to be cognizant of that and accept the fact that we have an, an inherent responsibility as a result of that. That didn't happen. When I was at Netscape, you know, there was no consumer uh, crowdfunding. And I think it's great that there is, but it's different in the protocol world versus the SaaS world. And it, it behooves all of us to recognize that and accept a certain a modicum of responsibility related to that. Those of us who aren't um, as um, who aren't caught up with your background, which, which is so awesome, by the way. Uh, just generally speaking, with the background at CIA, NASA, Goldman Sachs, and of course Netscape, um, what was it that um, what, was there something that was in you while you were at those companies that was looking ahead at a future like this, or was there a shift at some point where you said uh, the future is different? Yeah, and, and the way I think about how to get there has changed even in the last five years of starting Abra. Um, but if you go back to the beginning of Abra, it was really the culmination of a lot of years in, in soft banking, traditional banking, software payments, and then working in developing markets to say, okay, is there a better banking solution for consumers who are disenfranchised via the existing banking system? And... What I ultimately decided is is that they all deserve to have the same solution, uh, which became Abra. But I, I approached it from uh, very much a regulatory arbitrage perspective because I was so frustrated with the work that I was doing uh, in my last company, which is now run by a company called Digicel, which is, if there's anybody here in the Caribbean, it's the wireless carrier that you're probably roaming with when you go to the Caribbean or Central America. And they, they operate in like uh, something like 40 countries. And they provide um, mobile banking services like uh, M-Pesa in Kenya, for example. And I spent years trying to build a remittance backbone, working with the uh, the DBOs that you heard about earlier for money transfer licenses, in the pure play remittance world. It was using smartphones, but or and, and feature phones, but it was it was pre crypto, and it was a regulatory nightmare. Uh, and it got geometrically worse as we added more countries to the mix. It was just trying to use smartphones with stored value across. And countries just made the problem geometrically harder as N got larger. And my original thought was the beauty of crypto, because I had been studying the ideas around this since my early cypherpunk days in the early 90s, late 80s, even early 90s, before it was even called cypherpunk. But, but um, you know, there was always this, this kind of grand vision of digital money that had no central trust, but nobody could solve, uh, you know, nobody could solve the double spend problem. And so when I first realized that, hey, it's possible to solve the double spend problem, this is really interesting because the single biggest problem I have is getting this thing to work everywhere. And solving the d double spend problem is the ultimate regulatory arbitrage. Turns out, while that's true, um, it's also a nightmare because it's incredibly expensive, right? Bitcoin is the most... Uh, you know, how, how would I say, um, what's, what's a polite way to say it? It's, 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 it's a nightmare from, from a scalability perspective, right? And it just, it, it's, it's, it wasn't meant to be scalable. It was meant to solve the double spend problem. And the reason that nobody could figure it out before was in theory, it takes every computer in the world to solve the problem. And from an academic perspective, that's horrible. That's why I'm convinced Satoshi's not an academic. Um, so, 
so everything that I had done before that was kind of like pushing me in this direction to say, okay, I understand the tech, I understand banking. I had enough knowledge from my time on, on uh, as a quant to understand how to build synthetic assets, which is was how we were approaching this problem in the early days. How do I use Bitcoin to send dollars, for example? Not different, not very different than how Dai or synthetics works, but with Abra as the counterparty, which turned out to be um, um, a little bit ahead of its time. Uh, stable coins are a little bit more efficient than than our version of synthetics. Um, and if you're not familiar with the, the history of synthetic assets that we created. Um, you, you, I did a, t a talk at MIT, which has got a huge number of views, uh, which where I outline exactly how synthetic assets work, and you can search for that. Um, but anyway, sorry for the long-winded answer, but it, it's been a progression of, of uh, you know, a lot of different things that have put me in a fortunate enough position to see crypto as uh, probably too early, but but I saw crypto as a potential solution to some big problems in banking, and I think those problems are and my vision are starting to catch up with reality. But I was definitely too early. Um, but now I think it's catching up. That, that, that brings, up, brings up a question that someone had um, pre, pre meeting, uh, which said um, the, the way that Abra works is pretty unique. Uh, you use the Bitcoin blockchain and you use smart contracts. Can you give us an overview of what? Like, I guess what the structure is, what the stack is? Yeah, so, so to be clear, we don't use Bitcoin based synthetics anymore uh, for a couple of reasons regulatory. Um, scalability, uh, everything that is non-crypto in our system is stable coins now. So if you're holding uh, or it's um, if it's outside the U.S., it's held at a, a banking partner if it's not dollars. So if you're using ABRA in the U.S., the only fiat currency you'll see is dollars. If you're outside the U.S., you can actually choose one of 50 different fiat currencies. Um, all the USD uh, currencies in our system are actual stable coins. When we started ABRA, Everything in the system, not dissimilar to BitMEX, was a synthetic. So if you're holding dollars on BitMEX, it's actually a synthetic, right? It's, it's all Bitcoin based. So that's what Abra did. Um, the difference on BitMEX is one, that they, they don't have any regulate, regulatory oversight, and at least they're not, not so far. And, and two, they're not the counterparty, somebody else is. And so with Abra, we were the counterparty to 100% of those transactions, and then we had to hedge the counterparty risk, which was incredibly expensive. And so um, not doing that anymore has made Abra much closer to be profitable than the business we used to run. Even Ether, when we launched it out of the gate, was initially a Bitcoin synthetic, um, which is, by the, like I said, exactly what um, what BitMEX does uh, for their perpetual swaps. So, um, like I said, it worked fine. It's it scaled uh, for our early user base. Um, we had all the same scalability problems that any, any, everybody else had in 17 and 18. But as soon as we migrated to um, you know, be, be native assets, uh, we were able to grow much faster. And so it was a good test to show that synthetics would work ultimately. I guess that was our gift back to the community. Uh, but at scale, not a good way to run a business right now. How, how excited are you about ETH 2.0? Um, do you think it's going to happen? Uh, which is a question that some people have. And is there a chain, if not Ethereum, that you think is superior in, um, at least when it comes to scalability? Yeah, so... Um, I do, I'm very bullish on Ethereum 2.0. I think it's still going to take a couple of years. I mean, look, let's say that they're, that they're spot on with November, November, January really doesn't matter because phase zero, I think is going to take a year. Um, and, and, and I, my understanding of how to explain phase zero is that, um, in order to turn on proof of stake, you need a certain number of nodes that are staking a certain amount of ETH and they've programmed into the network enough time to make that happen. And by most estimates, I think that's a year, right? It could be faster. I think they're, given the yield potential up front, I think there may be a mad rush. Uh, but if that comes down quickly, it could also smooth out the curve quickly. So, so I think everybody who's tried to run the math on that has come to a conclusion that it's going to be, you know, probably a year. And then you get into the other phases of making 2.0 work. And um, it's going to be a while. But if it doesn't happen, there is no plan B for Ethereum, for sure. And it will basically suffer permanently from from you know being relegated to being able to effectively be a stablecoin platform for trading because it won't scale for anything else. And that's really the beauty of Ethereum 2.0 for me is is that it takes Ethereum from being a test platform for token issuance and smart contracts to really being a, a platform that can enable uh, the next generation of banking. 
uh, and and mostly from a scalability perspective. So yes, I'm very bullish on it, um, and I'm 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 very impressed with the tenacity of the team and their ability to keep their heads down. And they've taken a lot of crap uh, uh, about this, and, th and they did completely underestimate the complexity of what they were taking on, and that's fine. Um, again, the only difference between them making that mistake and mis similar mistakes that have been made throughout history is is that people keep real money on Ethereum as opposed to academic projects that we had you know years ago. Um, you know, IPv4 versus v6, which was all done you know in a lab where there was no real money involved in the early days, right? So anyway, so in terms of other projects, um, I follow a lot of them. Um, I think a lot of them take very different approaches that are very interesting to me. Um, I think Cardano is interesting. Uh, I think I think Stellar for new tokens is interesting um, for different reasons. Um, there's a lot of DeFi projects, which I'm not going to get into specifically, that I think are interesting, but not necessarily as a smart contract platform, but platforms that would use smart contracts for sure. Um, I, I, I'm still unclear on Tron. I go back and forth on, on that one. I, I need to spend more time on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are certainly other, look, the, the, the problem is, is that we're in a VH, we're, we're in a potentially VHS versus Betamax situation, right? Meaning that it, it may not ultimately matter how much better these other platforms are because of the network effects, right? You probably saw the announcement today that, uh, uh, Tether is moving another, I think it was another billion off of Tron onto ETH. Now, from a scalability perspective, that makes no sense. It really doesn't. But the Tether folks have no choice because that's where the demand is. So is it true that Ethereum has reached a network effect status that will allow it to break through in terms of these banking applications that I'm talking about, regardless of how good Cardano is? I don't know. It's, it's unclear to me as to whether the network effects in the trading world will trans and the speculation casino world will translate into banking or whether it won't matter. I think that platforms like um, Stellar uh, will find a niche in, in certain types of asset creation um, that maybe aren't consumer facing like trade finance. Uh, we'll see. But certainly Ethereum is, is pushing the, 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 the boundary on, on network effects as it relates to um, smart contract and being the, the world's computer. Uh, in a way that Bitcoin has the network effects around being digital gold. But if uh, you're in this meetup, in the, in the actual Zoom meeting, if you would like to ask a question over voice, uh, there's a little bar at the bottom of the screen called Reactions. Uh, tap one of the reactions, it's a thumbs up or a clap, and, and you'll see it and, and call, call on you so you can actually ask a question over voice. If you have more questions, leave them in the chat box, and we're going to continue going through them, as long as Bill allows us to, to take his time. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple more questions uh, on our side. Uh, were there a few from the stream that you wanted to get to? Somebody mentioned, by the way, online that we should all look at Ergo. Uh, they're re you know doing a lot of work around Oracle pools, and yeah, I, I, I've looked into this. And and um, again, the decentralized Oracle problem is uh, is a tough one. They claim that they're close, and I hope they figure it out. So just shout out to them for their efforts. Oh man, look at that. that's a coveted shout out. Someone asked a question about the challenges of, of Abit. Uh, when you're looking out into the future, is there, uh, aside from things like scalability with chains and adoption overall, um, what are some unique challenges that you guys are facing that uh, there's really no answers to, but, but maybe there's people in the community who can help find answers to? Well, I know this isn't what you were thinking when you asked the question, but most of our employees are in California and, and the West Coast, like, you know, Oregon and Washington. And we've got people living in, in AQIs of, of 500 right now that can, can't go outside because you literally can't breathe. And this is after being at home with, with school age kids with COVID and all this other crap. And it's like, how much more shit can we put on the pile for, for, uh, for people in, in the West Coast? Um, so I have to think about my employees, right? And, and our productivity uh, has been amazing. I mean, since we basically stopped work coming into our, our office, not all of our employees were, were centrally, but, but since we went completely remote, our productivity hasn't missed a beat. And I worry about that, not in the context of our, is our productivity going to fall? If our productivity falls for a few months, we'll survive. I just worry about our employees because these are, these are people I care about. And so, 
so I, I spend a lot of time on that, and I, and I should. It's my job and part of my job. And so I know, I know that wasn't the intent of your question, but I have to throw that out there because without our people, we're nothing. Um, and, and so I would also say that um, it's a multidimensional problem because as, as good as we are at, at delivering features, um, the, the, th the three-person shop developing another DeFi exchange is always going to be faster than what we can do. And we're still a startup, you know, we're, we're less than 50 people. So, but those three or four people, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to be able to move faster than we can. Well, we can move faster than, than a large exchange or a large bank. And, and so I have to think about, okay, yeah, we have an 18 month roadmap, but where has the technology shifted since we created that roadmap and to the point where we have to rethink things and I'm constantly having that conversation with my team. Uh, luckily, we've got it mostly right, at least over time. It's, it's proven that we've gotten it mostly right, but we've shifted because our belief, I don't think too much in terms of, okay, um, it's interesting, Keith Robway uh, uh, had this uh, video snippet online today where he came out and said, it's ridiculous for consumer companies to go out and ask consumers what they want uh, because consumers don't know what they want. Now. Uh, you know, Keith is Keith, and I actually think that he's probably 65% right. Because if you've got an existing product, you're not doing everything right. If you've got a completely new product, I get it. I totally get it. It's like, it's like Star Wars Episode Four, right? I mean, you're not going to go out and ask consumers what they want and then create Episode Four. But if you've got Episode Four, Five, and Six, and then you're going to go create the new trilogy and, you know, think consumers don't have expectations, you're smoking dope. And... If you have an existing product like Abra, you have to basically be in tune with your responsibility to those users, which is different than saying, okay, what should Abra 0.1 look like? And, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about that and, and, and looking at that from a multidimensional perspective. I also spend a lot of time with the ecosystem of partners that we need to make that happen. And um, it's complex and everything from bank partners to payments partners to crypto uh, platform partners. Um, it's, just, it's a huge list. And then there's the growth side of the business, meaning how do you all find out about Abra? And, and so we spend a lot of time on that ecosystem as well. And it's, it's, it's a, a lot of moving parts, but it all starts with the people. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know that it's crypt, you know, being in crypto per se. I think if, if you're all in on being CEO of a startup and you have the grit to accept the fact that, Hey, if, if 0 0.1 or 0 0.5 or 0 0.9 doesn't work, I'll just go do something else. It's not going to age you because you'll have forgotten about it in, in, in 18 months, you'll be doing something else. But if you're really going to commit to, and look, and I, when I say commit, if you're really wrong and the market doesn't want what you've got, eventually you got to move on. But if the market is there and you're convinced and you've, you know, you're going to plow through and you're going to have the grit to see it through, that in and of itself is going to aid you. That's just the way it goes. I, I mean, and that doesn't matter whether it's crypto or selling shoes, the founder of Zappos or, or whatever. I, I, it's it's, it's going to age you. And, and so I think what, what, what bothers me about crypto and, and what, I'm calling the, what I'll call the crypto space is, is when I talk to the average person who's involved in some way in the cryptocurrency space, 90% of what everyone says overlaps. Unbelievable, right? Uh, you know, don't trust the man, uh, you know, want a trustless society, believe in decentralization, believe in the benefits of this, the future of banking. But yet there's this, this um, fractionalization that goes on within broader crypto, cryptocurrency where, you know, I, I don't know a, a nice way to say it, that, that my shit is the only shit that doesn't stink. And so it, it's like somebody on the outside who's not in crypto would listen to us and go, you're all the same. Like everybody in this space talks about the same stuff but you think that everybody else in this space is full of crap for some reason. I don't get that. And, and so 
we need to, I'm not trying to basically say it's a, we need a kumbaya moment. Uh, you know, I, we're developers at the end of the day. And so developers have uh, emotional issues. So our emotional intelligence quotient tends to be a little bit lower than the average person. So be it, I'll, I'll, I'll embrace it and move on. But, but at some point we need to accept the fact that regardless of which of these projects we're working on, we're mostly here for the same reason. Um, that ages me because I have a vested interest in the broader space moving forward. Uh, and there's very little I feel I can do about it, except just every once in a while, you know, correct someone and hope that over years it'll have an effect. But, but running a company will certainly aid you more than working in crypto, for sure. Hey, I, I don't have to do this. I choose to do it. So I don't deserve anyone's sympathy. Um, I want to do it. So uh, it'd be clear. And my kids watch what I do and they're like, you know, dad, w w you know, sometimes they're like, why are you doing this to yourself? And I love it. That's the truth. And so I don't need, um, you know, I don't need permission or approval. Um, I, I choose to do it. Uh, but I also accept the price that you pay for doing it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Somebody, somebody asked. Uh, you know, there, there were some questions about Bitcoin versus Bcash. I don't know if you were, or sorry, I said Bcash, Bitcoin Cash. Uh, there were some other questions about varying uh, chains fighting each other. I don't know if you want to talk about. Uh, whatever. So. I'm happy to answer. Take on any questions. Just if, yeah. if I can. There may be technology questions that are beyond my ability, but I'll, I'll try. Yeah. Um, so I mean, when it comes to day-to-day -day spending, somebody asked. Sure. Look, uh, I was I was on the, the side of Segwit2x that lost. Um, and, I, and I say lost in the sense of I, I wanted it to happen. Most of the people that were that wanted it to happen now say they were wrong. I don't think we were wrong. I think we went about it the wrong way. Um, and that was a mistake. I think that um, it, Satoshi's mistake was changing the block size. If, if, if Bitcoin had an eight meg block size the entire time and it was eight megs today, I, I assure you no one would be talking about this. No one would be saying we need to lower the block size. It would be a complete non-issue. Um, and the biggest mistake Bitcoin made was giving up the GitHub control to other people that weren't mature enough to manage the process. They may have been better developers than Gavin, but they weren't more mature managers than Gavin, and and so that was a mistake. But but look, I'm uh, I'm happy to fund Bitcoin Core developers if it came to that today to move the space forward. I have no problem with that. Um, you don't get everything you want, uh, but as a result of that, Bitcoin is not going to be a scalable on-chain solution for money transfer. It's simply not. It's not going to happen. And what Lightning does is it basically moves that off-chain into a more regulated, more centralized environment. That's what the developer community decided was best for all of us. And would I have done it that way? I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, Bitcoin Cash, on the other hand, you know, basically took the opposite approach of saying, yeah, we should have bigger blocks because Satoshi said that's what it was meant to be. And it's really not as dangerous as everyone says. And would it be better if they if we had 10x the number of developers working on those bigger blocks? Probably. Um, but Bitcoin Cash gets commensurately less usage and, and um, transaction volume anyway, so maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but I would love for both of them to coexist and Bitcoin Cash to become the eph ephemeral kind of model for moving money quickly between two parties and Bitcoin Cash to be digital gold if we can't have an all-in-one solution. I'm totally fine with that. Um, I know there's a lot of maximalists who hate when I say this, but I don't really, first of all, I don't really care what they think. And, and, and second of all, you know, I've lived this on the ground in enough countries to know that we need a regulatory arbitrage solution that works for person to person payments. And we don't have it. It could have been Bitcoin. It's not going to be Bitcoin. Maybe it will be Bitcoin cash. Maybe it will be something else. I don't know. Maybe we'll never get it, by the way. I don't know. Mm. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second one first, because just because it's easier. 
Uh, I can't. I can't. I can't say that you know we're definitely launching a debit card. I can say that it's top five most common requests uh, from our users, and and certainly top three from from the CEO to my team. Uh, and and so if we had it today, I'd be a very happy guy. Um, but that having been said, I, I have no no plans to announce. I just hope it happens at some point. In that regard, I guess I'm no different than the person who asked the question. Um, how's that for not answer answer? Um, and in terms of Venezuela, so. You know, authoritarian regimes, which is what Venezuela has devolved into, devolved into are, are, are a different challenge for the crypto banking model because there is no regulatory model that ABRA can easily fit into on the ground in the country. And that's where you really need to think about non-custodial or VPN slash tour. And you need to be very careful about what you're doing because if Big Brother decides they don't like what you're doing, your recourse as a consumer is is minimized versus, you know, we complain a lot in the U.S. about Big Brother, but the reality is is, is we have a lot more recourse and a lot more um, freedom to do what we want to do than, than you're going to have in Venezuela. So, so I think crypto banking is more needed in Venezuela even than it is in the U.S. right now. It's, it's needed in the U.S. more than people realize, but I think it's even more needed in Venezuela. The problem is is that the, the way things are set up, it makes it very hard for Abra. Now, shout out to our friends at AirTM. Uh, I love those guys. Um, they basically enable dollar-denominated accounts for people in Mexico, Venezuela, and then run a P2P service a la Paxful and local Bitcoins to get the money in and out. Absolutely th- fantastic. Uh, and, and so, but that's, uh, again, back to this, the stack that I talked about uh, an hour ago. That, that was really just, that's, that's one piece of the stack. How do I hold dollars? And how do I potentially, you know, get the dollars in and out of my wallet? It doesn't talk about interest, doesn't talk about save, you know, investments, doesn't talk about P2P payments. Um, but it's a start. And so kudos to them. But I, I, I so desperately wish we could build a Venezuelan specific stack. I just don't see how we could do it from a regulatory perspective. But I know it's, it's, it's desperately needed. And um, when things are desperately needed, people tend to find a way. We'll see. Some people ask about some features, uh, some ABRA features regarding loans um, and regarding uh, access to credit. Are, 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 is there a sneak peek that you can give us uh, regarding some some soon to come uh, ABRA features or products? I, 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 you will see us get into the lending world. I mean, we're already a large lender of crypto on the institutional side. Eventually, we'll get into that on the retail side. I don't have anything to announce today, but it's something that we think a lot about. Um, we think a lot of people are doing it wrong. And luckily, I mean, look, sometimes it's easier to just watch other people and learn. That's fine. But we also, I think, have a lot of insights as just given our history in, in traditional banking uh, as to how it should be done right. So we're going to we're gonna do it right eventually. Uh, it may take longer than others, but... You know, kind of like what Apple would say, when we do it, we're going to do it right, and that's that's fine. Abra feels the same about it. Um, uh, I think I think there's a lot more to do in person-to-person payments, which is uh, really why was the original use case for Abra, right? Uh, uh, a better remittance app, ABRA. So so I want to get back to that at some point, and I think that the evolution of stablecoins is 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 uh, making me very excited to get back to that to the point where my team is probably tired of hearing me talk about it, but. But um, that's something that I think is, is desperately needed, both consumer and business, um, for sure. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. We'll, we'll go through a few more, if that's okay with you, Bill. Sure. Um, somebody was asking about um, some trouble they were having with Abra specifically. So okay. They were asking, why can't we send crypto between Abra users? Uh, you can. So I'll show you. Um, if you have the Abra app open, there's a, a feature in there that um, allows you to um, send money. If you um, just going to go to share screen here, um, can you guys see my? Not yet. Can you see my phone now? Yes. So I'm going to go into Abra here. Um, in the main menu, so there's two ways to send money. Uh, there's the, uh, sorry for the large balances in my test app. Uh, 
there's the withdraw function in the bottom right. Now that's crypto generic, uh, crypto centric. So if I press that withdraw button in the bottom right, I can send to any crypto wallet in the world. Now I only ho am holding in this test app, um, true USD tether Bitcoin, but I can choose Bitcoin and then withdraw to any Bitcoin address. Okay. Or go back to the main screen here. If I click on the upper left here, and this is the person to person feature I was talking about before, you see where it says um, third item down, send to an Abra user. Uh, I'm not gonna press that because it's gonna bring up my entire address book of people's personal information. But when you, when you press that button, it brings up an address book of existing Abra users, as well as your, your personal contacts. And if you, send, if you click an Abra user, based on their phone number, it will actually send them crypt, uh, the money directly without going to the blockchain, which is obviously faster and cheaper because uh, there's no network fees involved. So, so we make it as easy as we realistically can, both inside of Abra and then outside of Abra to uh, send and receive uh, either dollars, uh, foreign currency, or even crypto uh, today. Okay, so I will go back here and stop that. Like, there we go. Um, hopefully, hopefully that answered our, our friend's question. It does, yeah. Uh, when, when broadly looking at crypto, a lot of us are really interested and in, uh, this, this theme comes up repeatedly about adoption or about mass adoption. Um, and different people have different views on this. When you look at the space and when you look at Abra, are you seeing Abra as somebody who is growing crypto adoption? Uh, or and is, that, is that even something that matters? And um, if, if it does, what are some markers for increased adoption that you think are really important? Some of us uh, in, in the questions previously have said, well, um, a lot of talk goes on about adoption, but it doesn't look like it. Yeah, I mean, look, we're, we're a consumer facing company. So it's like saying is, is does Netflix concern themselves with TCP IP adoption? Um, I, I can guarantee you that that is not a conversation happening in executive staff meetings at Netflix. Um, at the same time, we think about crypto in the context of the core businesses that we want to enable for our consumer and business customers. And there are, and there are plenty of crypto specific things that, that need to happen for Aber to work. And we do dig into those things, but they're driven first and foremost by what businesses we're trying to enable for our users. It's not, hey, um, we exist to make it easier to adopt crypto. Uh, we don't we don't think that way. Um, we know we've got a lot of people into crypto, but that's because of the businesses that we've chosen to enable, and that's great. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. I think that's that's the answer to your question. There's, um, I think that wraps up some of those hyper-specific questions there. Um, there's a lot more that will continue to pour in uh, in Discord or in the chat on Twitter or something. Sure. And people are, are always asking questions. I'm sure a lot of them are familiar and repetitive. So thank you for still taking your time to answer all of them. No, my pleasure. I know a lot of people have, it looks like nobody's uh, left. So so thanks for that and, and sticking well, with us how for- How is the stream doing for all of us who are here in the meetup? Uh, I don't know. Uh, hopefully somebody can message me and let me know. Um, I know we had uh, a bunch of people on the YouTube. Uh, we get more people viewing the recording on, on, on Twitter um, than we do watching in real time. But uh, usually it, it ends up being in the thousands over, over a few days. So what happens is, is it automatically posts the recording on each of them. So um, everything we post gets, gets a few thousand views pretty quickly. So I'm sure this will, this will be out there too. Well, you just did, but I'll, I'll, I'll put my own out to the, the Sacramento okay. Bitcoin meetup. And, and I also look forward to making a trip up to Sacramento to when I can and when we all can to meet in person um, and hopefully reminisce about how ridiculous this time was when we had to do it this way. Yeah, but uh, uh, Jabron already got the COVID, so uh, we'll see. Oh, really? I'm, well, I'm glad you're doing better if you're, if you're better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a while ago. Thanks to everybody who knows my health information. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, 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 I didn't know the private. Uh, <laughs> but, but yes. I'll, I'll let you guys work that out later. So we'll, we'll get involved in that. But, um, but yeah, I, I guess there's one last, one last question. 
is um, lo looking forward um, or, or looking at the landscape, is there, besides Abra, is there a, 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 an initiative that excites you a lot um, in, in the crypto space? It, do, it doesn't have to be, you know, like a blockchain, it could be a specific project. Well, in, in the crypto world, I'm, I'm really interested in, in NFTs and gaming and where that's all going to see who can make a, a run of it. There's a lot of companies getting seed and Series A funding funding right now in, in, in kind of blockchain crypto gaming that the public hasn't heard about. And that's awesome. I, 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 I'm super interested in that. Um, I'm personally very interested in AR augmented reality, where that's going uh, from a consumer perspective. Um, and online ed tech is education technology is interesting to me. Um, but the next kind of five years in augmented reality is going to be incredible. And it's going to change. It's basically going to be the equivalent of like an iPhone 1.0 kind of thing for all of us over the next few years. And, and so I can't wait to see that and how it affects things like education. And, you know, especially now when, when remote education is becoming such a, a, big, a big deal. So. Yeah, that's super awesome. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for taking your time out, for you and your team to take your time out to be here. Um, we'll continue the party on Discord. Uh, so we have some links in the chat if you want to ask us some more questions or have some more fun stuff to talk about. Join our Discord and that will be our virtual hangout afterwards. Uh, everyone is basically muted, but a silent round of applause for Bill. There's some emojis, some thumbs up going on here. Oh, thank you. All right. We got some thumbs up. We got some round of applause. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, David uh, posted uh, another link to our Discord. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group. We have a Facebook group. Um, David's going to be having this recording on our uh, YouTube, which isn't as popular as the Haber YouTube, but uh, we'll still put it up there. we got uh, Bill on Twitter. He's a pretty active tweeter, so definitely uh, check that out. And um, the Sacramento uh, Bitcoin meetup group is the main way to get in touch with us. Uh, David, if you could post the, uh, the link to our, our meetup group. And uh, Starfish and San Francisco blockchain group as well. Um, and uh, so uh, now what we always do in our meetup is uh, usually we give a minute for anybody to talk about anything they want. But uh, since we have a larger group here today, we're lowering that to 30 seconds. So um, if somebody wants to chat, uh, Jabron, do they have to put their reactions first to chat or can they just unmute themselves? Or? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you, I guess, if, you know, if you want to say something, uh, you can just unmute yourself. Floor. Yeah, yeah. If you unmute yourself, you have the floor, and uh, we try to be open and transparent. We never know what we're going to get, but uh, usually we do get some cool stuff. So uh, either unmute yourself or click the reactions. And then um, if I could say another uh, uh, word out to the Abra team, thank you very much. Uh, Bill is obviously the, the tip of the spear, but there's a whole bunch of people uh, behind him doing that. Um, Special shout out to everybody there. And uh, when you tweet it out, be sure to put a link to the Sacramento uh, Bitcoin meetup group <laughs> in case I haven't plugged that enough here. So, uh, Jabron, did we get anybody that wants to have uh, 30 seconds for the floor? We did it. I think um, I think that wraps it up. Thanks again, Bill. All right. That, uh, that, that wraps it up. And um, uh, I'm wondering, uh, Joe, David, do you have anything to add? So just curious, uh, Bill, since uh, you said you're so into the, in the AR, uh, have you have you played in a uh, Somnium space? In, in, say the say that again. Oh, Pete McMew. Oh, so, sorry. Say it again. Have I played in what space? Somnium space the VR. Oh no, not yet. I I, I would oh, love to. Okay. I would love to. I'm I just saw the. Uh, anyway, yes, I would love to, but I haven't I haven't yet. Okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of t there's a bunch of things. I I I have a kind of a running list of stuff in the AR VR space to try and uh, I'm going to take a few days off sometime soon. And part of what I'm going to do is get caught up on, on all that stuff. Yeah. It's definitely cool space. Definitely yeah. Cool. Space. cool. Well, uh, if everybody, uh, oh, did, uh, if anybody has anything else to say, just go ahead and, uh, uh shout out and, um, uh, oh, uh, for, uh, somebody asked about the replay. It'll be on the Abra Twitter and it'll be on our, uh, uh, it'll be on our YouTube as well. Um, and the other thing.
thing that I wanted to say is, uh, yeah, Bill, uh, thank you very much for this. And uh, anytime you guys have a big new release, we should be the first ones to know. That's uh, that's all all I'm saying. We, we had a great time. And if you would like to come back, uh, feel free to hit us up. Uh, I didn't get that many of my questions answered, but uh, I guess I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet my questions out to you at a, at, at a later later day but um everybody uh thank you so much and uh bill thank you and we are the sacramento bitcoin meetup group we meet on the second and fourth tuesday every month just go to meetup look up sacramento bitcoin and uh you'll see us and even if you're not in sacramento you can join because we've been doing our meetings correction for brian monday second Mon- and fourth oh gosh, monday i'm sorry second and fourth <laughs> monday thank you david it's all good so uh second and fourth monday uh come on down and uh uh, meet up with us, and um, we have great speakers like Bill uh, twice a month. So uh, it's an advanced intermediate group, and if this is your first time, we hope to see you again. Usually we do a little bit more uh, interaction with the crowd, uh, but uh, we had a, a bit of a large crowd today, so we weren't able to do as much crowd work. But um, I think I think that's everything. Did I miss anything, guys? That's all, guys. Be safe. See you guys. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jabron and uh, Joe and David and uh, Albert team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good night.